Welcome back to another incredible episode of the Rants and Gems Real Estate Podcast. My name is Matt Garland, NMLS number 58700, better known as MG the Mortgage Guy. And my name is Kiana Watson, license number 317576. Real estate broker extraordinaire. extraordinaire. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. You're looking extraordinary today, I too. I mean, this you know, color is like, you know. You know. I'm mad. I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to tell you. I'm coming with the fashions. If you're doing it, if you want to do anything, if you watch this show, you just need to come for the fashions. I, I came to deliver. Nah, you came with a cape. <laughs> and with these episodes. That's when I knew it was serious. I said, this woman came on a cape. Oh, shit. All right, so enough of this, right? Let's introduce our lovely guest to, to the left of you. All right, right here to the left of me, we have Charm City Buyers. Let's give it up and for them, y'all. Let's give it up for them. So, you guys, they're going to tell a little bit, about, little bit about themselves, but they are from Baltimore. They are basically developing almost the entire city of Baltimore, if you, if, if, you, if you leave it up to me to tell it. And what I love about the, them is they have been out here from Vandos to Blocks. So they're, they have started from the bottom and now they are here. Mm-hmm. And they're here to share a lot of their gifts with us, um, some special announcements, and just let's talk about how you started to build this wealth and build community through real estate. So let's talk about it. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I'm Kiara. And I'm Khalil. And so we really started investing in real estate fresh out of college. We were a year out. Um, We were really kind of going through this transition, even as a couple to say, if we're doing this thing together, like what does that look like long term? You know, if I have my own goals, he has his own goals. If we're gonna do this together, what does this look like as a unit? And so we started to play around with a lot of different ideas of investing in businesses. And at that time, I guess it's kind of new, new, because now everyone's doing like uh, vending machines and stuff like that. Like we looked at a little bit of everything and real estate was just one of those things that checked the most boxes. And we dove really far in making that happen. Yeah, our criteria was basically like community building, right? Positive impact on the world, generating wealth and something we can pass on. Mm-hmm. So real estate was it for us. Yeah. And um, ever since we started, we never turned back. We just kept moving full steam ahead. Nice. I love it. So when did you guys fall in love with real estate? So I real estate was actually something I had always been interested in. So we take it all the way back. So I'm close born and raised in Baltimore. I'm from Pennsylvania. And so growing up, I learned about a town called Hensonville that my ancestors started in 1820s, in the 1820s. Wait, your ancestors mm. started a town? Yeah, did it? Yes. Shit. So this the, is going to write <laughs> Right. <laughs> we just started. So, so it's called Hensonville, and it's actually the land that Lincoln University, the first HBCU, sits on is the land of Hensonville. Wow. And so I was raised learning that story and the power of that and owning land and real estate and, and those types of things. And so it kind of was like, ingrained in me as a seed to be really interested in that transformation, right? Building neighborhoods, building communities, doing real estate. Um, So that was kind of my start. And then for him, he's always been really entrepreneurial. Yeah, for me, it was entrepreneurship from the jump, always, period. The Mm -hmm. corporate world, it wasn't quite my thing. It didn't (laughs) resonate. It wasn't something that I knew I would love. Um, Mm -hmm. So from like starting at high school with a little uh, 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 company dancing and and doing parties and hosting events and things, to like college and then moving forward, I always knew that something about me was going to be in the leadership role, uh, owning some kind of business. Mm -hmm. And when Kiara introduced the idea of of real estate and buying properties and stuff, I'm like, say less. Mm -hmm. Say less. Keep it going. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I love the partnership. Yeah. Yeah. How long you guys been together for? About 13 years. Yeah, 13 years. 13 years. We've been married for eight. Married for eight years. That that deserves a hint. Yeah. 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 We met in college, so you know how college is, but we fell in love immediately, and it was yeah. like, all right, he this is it. Immediately. No, no, no. That was the sound like, oh, yes. I'm dead serious. Let him know. Let him know. All right, so, <laughs> so check it out. Check it out. How, how we met, right? Um, um, a week before we met, my I saw That's her in a so dream. <laughs> <laughs> he oh, says, you said what? A week before we met, I saw her in, in a dream. Mm. And I, like, I could barely see her. There was a, a silhouette on the outside, and I woke up. I'm like, I don't know what that was, but whatever. All right, cool. A week later, my boy sent me up on, on the, um, the football team. We go into Lafayette College, her college. It was a rival school. I went to Lehigh. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I landed at her apartment, and it was like three guys, three girls. The music was good. The drinks were pouring. It was just a vibe, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. So um, when I saw her sitting on a couch, I'm like, that's her. So of course, I had to introduce myself. One thing led to another. You know, eight years later, eight years of marriage later, mm-hmm. here we are. Man, I that's amazing. It. I love that's that. Amazing. I love that. That's, that's dope. Yeah. College sweethearts mm-hmm. to buying 
freaking bandos. Yeah. <laughs> How the hell did y'all start buying bandos yeah. together? So, Talk to us about that. So when we, so we're, um, I graduated, Chloe graduated a year before me. When I graduated college, I actually moved to Connecticut. Um, so I was in Hartford, Connecticut. And um, Chloe always says he followed love because he was in Baltimore. Yeah. So he moved to Connecticut with me for a little while. And so we're both working full time. And I was like, you know, this really isn't isn't it like I'm not, right. I can't sit here and wait until a pension. I'm not about to fool with these people and put all of everything I want into, you know, what this this company decides to do for for me. And he was the same way. And he was already entrepreneurial. He's like, well, what's, what are we going to do? <laughs> and so um, we bought our first property um, and it was a three unit shell in Hartford, Connecticut. And our goal at first was we were going to wholesale because that's what everybody wants to do when they start real estate, right? And so we we're going to wholesale. And so we, all the numbers were good. Um, we bought the property all cash, $26,000 because we had saved up. And what year was this? This was 2012. We bought it all cash and uh, we we're going to wholesale it. And so what happened was at that time, we we're going to RIA meetings. Like we were trying to get in the room with people and, and network. And um, nobody would touch it. And so what we realized <laughs> at one point, we were sitting on the stoop of the house after we bought it because we were feeling ourselves at that point. Like we're young. Of course, we just bought yeah, this house. Yeah, yeah. house. I'm sitting you on my up, stoop, you right? Yeah. Like I'm going to sit on my stoop. So we sat on there. We were just <laughs> sitting. And somebody was walking on the street and was like, hey, y'all just bought this house? And we were like, yeah. And it was like, don't y'all know this street called murder? And we was like. What? <laughs> ah, Excuse me? Say that. It's called Say murder. Call, don't you know this street called murder? And we was like, <laughs> like, sir, I did not know that. You're right. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we learned was that because we're in a new area, new neighborhood, I'm not from Connecticut. Clue's not from Connecticut. So we didn't know all the pieces. We knew the numbers. Mm -hmm. And so what we found was that people were shying away from this neighborhood and this space because of reputation that had gained over all this time. Um, and so, but we doubled down and we're like, no, our numbers are good. This is a three unit property. There's tons of opportunity. We finna do this ourselves. And so um, we did some networking, connected with actually a nonprofit in the area that was focused on that neighborhood, ended up doing a $120,000 renovation for our very first deal. So you're 150,000 in. Mm. About $150,000 in. Um, we finished that renovation probably about six months or so. Um, and we brought in about $2,700 a month mm. um, in that cash flow, you know, after everything, probably cash flow about eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 a month nice. on that first deal. On, on um, a murder street. On, on a murder street. On murder street. And let me tell you, that at that time, it was just us, yeah. right? Fast forward to now. There's a community garden across the street. They yep. repaved the street. There's speed humps to slow people down. There are multiple other rehabs mm -hmm. and developments happening. Construct like we yeah, we feel like we transformed the area or at least played a part in it. Mm -hmm. That's dope. That's There's dope. people seeing the opportunity because what we found, and this kind of laid the foundation for everything that we do even in Baltimore now, that we have to see opportunities in our neighborhoods first, right? And so just because someone said and named this street murder doesn't mean that this street, the people on this street in these properties don't have value, right? right? Mm. And, and so it's only as valuable as we decide and we put that energy in that. And so we put that energy there and decided like, we can do this. And these people deserve to have quality housing. You know, we don't need to walk past bandos every day on our way to school. How do we take that ownership and be able to do that ourselves? Gentrify our own hoods. All right. Yeah. I love that. So, bandos. Bandos. You know, that's 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 slang term. Can we kind of break that down for the audience? What people, you know, people may not know what that is. Yeah. So, bandos, that's like the boarded up, especially in Baltimore, <laughs> right? You think of the boarded up, yeah. shelled up houses. They've mm -hmm. fallen down. Like, the houses we buy are a front wall and a tree growing up the middle. Yeah, they're, okay. they're vacant properties. Yeah, right? okay. Properties that have been disinvested for years. Yep. Properties that, um, like Kiara said, there's trees and vegetation growing out, spray paint, negative energy in mm -hmm. and, and around them. Mm -hmm. um, those are the bandos and the vacants. Yeah. So how did you guys go from Connecticut to Baltimore? So we came back home. Okay. I convinced her that I came up to Connecticut for love. Let's go back home, yeah. right? Um, so we came back home. We transferred our jobs. It was a whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. We had a rehab happening. I was in grad school. Kiara transferred her job. She was pregnant at the time. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of stuff happening at once, but we told our story to our friends and our family. Like, look, we bought this property. We didn't tell them beforehand. We told them after the fact, mm -hmm. after it was stable, after we started getting some tenants. Mm -hmm. um, and they were like, whoa, you're not in real estate. 
you don't have a history of this, you don't have friends and family or background, this, how are you doing it, mm -hmm. right? And then text after text and picture message and email after and call after call, like people want to know how to do this and how we got started. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we started in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, you, what year did y'all go back to Baltimore? 2013. 2013, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and what was your first project in, in Baltimore? How did that look? Yeah, right. Baltimore is not, a, yeah. you know, Baltimore is kind tricky. of- You, a, gotta, know, you gotta know what you're doing. It's kind of the wire in some places. Oh, see, look, <laughs> see, we, I don't want to fight you about the wire thing. <laughs> <laughs> Another trigger for me. <laughs> But let's keep it a hundred though. I was yeah. thinking the same. Let's, you know. I'm like, let's talk about Baltimore. Baltimore. Like yeah. really, like you you come back home yeah. and now you're looking at these numbers and you're looking at these vandals, you're looking at these opportunities. Yeah. And you're saying create your own opportunity. How did you guys get started in Baltimore? Yeah. So the Connecticut property really set that foundation for seeing the opportunity, right? And so we got to Baltimore and it said, OK, how do we find that same opportunity here? Because we're driving around. And to me, all I saw was opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw, you know, kind of that same thing, like this street called murder. So I'm not touching that. That's what I saw in Baltimore. And so um, what we did was pay attention to what was happening and what was coming. And so the very first property in Baltimore, um, there was this area that was developed, developing called Patterson Park, um, which probably five, 10 years before that was Tons it was of bandos, yeah, right? It was rough. Um, and so there was a lot of development happening. And so you're, we were seeing a lot of gentrification starting to pop off at Patterson Park. And then we also knew Johns Hopkins Hospital was is still the largest property owner in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And so they were buying up everything. And so we knew that they were making plans to do something. Um, and so we bought in the middle of those two areas, hmm. right? So we bought a property smack dab in the middle, understanding that there's only so many properties. And so the Patterson Park development was going to grow and push. And so was Johns Hopkins. And so it was going to hit that property at some point. So we're being strategic, right? Hmm. So that's number one. Number two, we bought it well. So we bought it from and um, it was an auctioneer that was selling the property um, in McKeldery Park, actually. And um, so they're selling it and that's cool, but in real estate, right, you only get what you can ask for. And so most people with an auctioneer, you think you gotta buy it all cash or something fast. We asked them to sell or finance it. And Listen, we said- we, we young, we bold, we just did our first triplex. Like, ain't nothing we can't do. Go right. ahead, ask the question, yeah. see what they say. Yeah, and we had just done, a, done that deal with a nonprofit. So it set that foundation for how creative you can get with getting access to funding and, and money for deals. And so our second property, the one in Baltimore, we seller finance that. So break down seller financing yep. for folks who don't know what that is. Absolutely. So we said rather than paying you um, whatever it was, like 20. A little less than 30. Yeah, a little less yeah. than 30,000. Rather than paying that to you all at once, would you be willing to hold the note? Would you be willing for me to pay you over time instead of paying you all up front? Um, so we ended up having a mortgage similar to what you would have with a bank, but it was just the seller was the one that was the, the bank. Was the bank. Um, and so we did, um, I think it was like three years, mm -hmm. um, a three-year seller finance deal with them. Um, so the we were paying them six seventy five dollars a month for that three years. Um, we did, we worked with a private lender, so an individual who had money that was just sitting there, they paid, we had a down payment, so they put money up towards the down payment. Um, and then we rented that property for about $1,100 a month. Mm. All right. Um, so that was that was the second deal. We probably put maybe 10 to 15 into it, um, bought it for about 30, 10 to 15 into it. So we're all in 45 and rented it for $1,100 a month. Now fast forward, um, about five, five, six years later, houses in that same neighborhood are selling for $160,000, $170,000. Oh, that's Damn. good. So how did you guys find out about John Hopkins? You know, because I think that's one key thing that people miss out on yep. is research and yeah. finding out yep. what the corporations yep. are doing. So how did you guys go about finding out that John Hopkins was going to go out, was buying mm -hmm. all this property in the area? So yeah. for us, it's um, it's really important to get specific and like zero down and get very niche. Mm -hmm. um, so Baltimore is it. Right. right. We focus on Baltimore and we can learn as much as possible about Baltimore through other developers, through newspapers, mm -hmm. through um, uh, uh, TV shows, uh, news, um, a little bit of everything. And like being able to focus and find out about those things and hone in on those things and knowing that anchor institutions are real mm -hmm. and that key developments happen. And then when a, a key commercial development happens, those residential properties around are going to benefit from it because mm -hmm. a rising ship, I mean, a rising tide lifts all, all ships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we saw the opportunity immediately. I'm like, all right, let's jump on this. Yeah, like we always talk about following the money, 
right? So even if you don't have all the cash, there's all these entities putting this money into different projects across the city. The city, the state, everyone that put all those millions of dollars in there have skin in the game on making sure that this is successful. Mm -hmm. So that's going to drive kind of that that flow, right? It's going to create that wave to be able to raise all those property values and start to get the interest. And so even for folks that have no idea about Baltimore, because everyone always wants to ask about zip codes or whatever else about the city, the very least you can do is read the newspaper. Mm. Like online, Mm -hmm. just really diving into what's happening, what's going on on the ground locally so that you can start seeing things like patterns. Wow. I just saw them talking about this neighborhood, you know, last week. Now they're talking about a whole nother development happening over there. Well, how do I dive down? Like how far are those in between? What properties are over there? So following the money that's already being spent really helps to narrow those types of things down. And specifically the real estate section. Yeah, right. The business section, not the sports section or the (laughs) cartoons. You know what I mean? I mean, that's all fun right. and dandy, but that that real estate section, when yeah. you see that the state of Maryland just put $20 million into a specific area, that piques your interest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or $30 million, or there's a, a $100 million TIF, a tax increment financing structure that goes into an area where they they basically make make a circle and say, everybody who pays property taxes in this area, those a portion of those property taxes are going to go towards this specific development. Um, that type of stuff is public knowledge. Yeah. Mm. So now you have your... Your one home mm-hmm. you already purchased in Baltimore. How did you continue to build your portfolio? Uh, most people start with one and, you know, you guys seem like you kind of came out really, like, really lucky because you didn't seem like you had any hiccups. But as you started to build your <laughs> like, as you started to build your portfolio, let's share yeah. some, of, some, some of the challenges that you face with building your portfolio and how you overcame those so you can continue to build out what you have now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that first, the very Our first, first deal, we, we could go through, we could spend, yeah, right, we <laughs> bought the first one wrong, right? Yeah. So not only was it on a street called murder, we were like, um, so again, you're out of college, you're trying to save money, right? Um, so we had the option of doing a full warranty deed, or, um, and that would cost another $1,200, mm-hmm. or a quick claim deed. And we said, well, let's just save the $1,200. What's the difference between the two? So the difference between the two, um, I explain a quick claim deed as buying a house with all its baggage, right? So what's the baggage? That is the taxes, the water bill, any old mortgages or liens, right? Anything against the property. So when you do a quick claim deed, you're buying the property and all its baggage versus a full warranty deed, you're able to buy a property free of all liens and encumbrances, no baggage, right? Mm-hmm. Just the property. Um, so we bought the property and all its baggage. And in those bags was an $8,000 water bill and a $3,000 tax bill. A $3,000 tax bill. So we didn't swing a hammer before we had to write a check. And listen, the, the, mm. the lender who provided us the construction loan, they weren't going to give us anything until those things were cleared yeah. because the lender wanted to be in first position. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So that I mean, so we could go all day. Long. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Look, we're, we're so not the people to sit here and act like we went yeah. through like we are valedictorians of school park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Summa cum laude. The second property. We walk in through the auctioneers giving us all the terms and stuff. Like, all right, cool, cool. We close on it. We acquire, get the private lender, the seller financing terms work. We open up the sink in, 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 in the kitchen and like the plumbing's loose. Like plumbing ain't supposed to be loose. Is it tied in behind the wall? Turns out they just stuck some plumbing in there oh, and made it look like it was cool. No plumbing running. Yeah. We got stories for days. Stories for days. Man. And then this is your second property. That was our second, second property, one. yeah. That's the second one. The difference between us and anybody else is that we didn't stop. Jim. Mm. Period. Keep going. Jim. Period. That's it. Like there's that's the only that's only we didn't have a trust fund. We didn't have an uncle that had been in real estate. We didn't have, you know, we just had, I think at the beginning, um, the we were kind of too young and naive to be scared to mm-hmm. start. Mm-hmm. Um, so we didn't deal with that fear. And the second thing I think that was really big for us is that we kept we kept things tight to the chest. Like we didn't go and tell everybody everything that we were doing until we had too much for anybody to tell us anything. Right. That was really the difference, because for me um, and Khalil, like we didn't need any help to be scared. You don't need help. <laughs> you, know? like, right. you don't need help to have fear going through the process. Um, and so we were able to lean on each other to be able to navigate that. Or sometimes he would be on and I'd be off and I'd be on and he'd yeah. be off. So we had the benefit of balancing between each other. Um, but but we we just kept going. 
Man, I, bad boys move in silence. silence. That's the key. You got to keep it. things close to your vest Look. because your family and friends don't know a damn thing. No. And right. they will tell you everything under the blue sun and they'd be wrong as hell. Absolutely. <laughs> no one thinking they're right. They're wrong. And, and, I, and sometimes out of their own, like, it's hard to explain to somebody that you're doing a $130,000 renovation when they make $45,000 a year. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. a different conversation. So yeah. sometimes you can't even fault them for not being able to wrap their heads around it because the things that a lot of people are doing right now are just so big yeah. compared to anything that our parents or their parents really understood. And so now they just look at us and kind of laugh and like, hey, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what they do. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like you gotta, you gotta keep that to your chest and make sure you're surrounding yourself with people who are either headed in the direction that you're trying to go or have been where you're trying to get to. Like, mm-hmm. that's it. You got to check your circle. Birds of a feather flock together. Right. That's exactly. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. he said you went from bandos to blocks. Yes. So now we're not talking about just one single property. Mm-hmm. How did you guys start building out blocks? Like, what made you start saying, okay, I'm focusing on this area, mm-hmm. and we're going to start developing our own community so that way we can... It's, it's, this is no longer Murder Street. This is Happy Street now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Um, the first time was actually a an accident to be completely honest. So we were doing marketing. So we were looking for, for new deals and new properties. We knew of, again, kind of following the money. We knew of some projects that were coming along and some other developers that were doing some great work. And we found one property on a street um, that was nearby. But as we were analyzing the deal, we looked across the street and the whole street was empty. And we're mm. like, and half the street we was on were empty. And we're and like, the, if we the do this. The appraiser told us. The appraiser yeah. was like, I mean, it's hard to appraise when you got all these other vacants yeah. all around. So it was like, if we're going to do this one, we got to do them all. And that's how that started. Yeah. And so we took that one property and then started to marketing to other owners. Because a lot of the properties, and this is something people don't realize about Baltimore, a lot of the vacant properties are actually not city owned. They're owned by individuals. They're owned by people who bought those houses thinking they could get something really cheap and just weren't held accountable to actually getting it done. It's about 90% mm-hmm. of them. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Mm. So how did you guys go about finding who's the owner of these properties? It's public record. Mm-hmm. So the land record shows you who the owner is. They give you the address where the owner currently lives or receives mail. Yeah. Um, and if that information is hard to find, somebody's paying the property taxes. Somebody's paying the water bill. You can always look at those records to find those too. Yeah, and we're we're old school. We still send letters. Our letters are pretty. They they got <laughs> their uh, design. You yeah. know, we handwrite on the envelopes mm. when, when we were doing them ourselves and everything. Old school tactics. Old school tactics. Old school we tactics. I wasn't cold calling nobody. Mm. So we um but yeah we sent letters and reached out to them. They would call us back, and because we were so targeted and knew exactly what we we're looking for. We get a lot of really good responses on um, when we're actually doing marketing because we're not out here just trying to do everything everywhere, but really intentional about what it is we're trying to accomplish. Mm, say that again. Yeah, yeah please. Intentional. <laughs> intentional. About what you're intentional. Do. Intentionality. Like, I think sometimes maybe because of the Internet and social media or whatever, it's, it's a lot of just kind of jumping around to whatever is cute at the time. Um, but we like to do things with purpose. And so we spend a lot of time, if, if we're going to do like a marketing push or a campaign, we know what our goals are, like what we're trying to accomplish with these properties so that even when we're sending the letters out, it's speaking to the owners, right? Mm-hmm. We know what your situation is because, you know, we targeting this one block. I know what's wrong with this block. Yeah. So <laughs> let us help you, you know, let us help you get it done. And just like our very first one, we, we sit on the block. And we'll yeah. talk to the neighbors and we'll understand what's going on in the area and yeah. get to know people. And that's really how you find not only people who will help you out and, hey, I just saw somebody walk into your property. Is that cool? Yeah, that's a plumber. But but you'll also find people who care yeah. right, and want to help you and, and do things politically mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, and, 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 and otherwise to make sure that you're doing well um, mm-hmm. and you got all the tools you need to be as successful as possible. Yeah. Mm. Man. Wow. I, I'm liking this conversation right. yeah. so far, and I think the common theme from a lot of our successful investors is they're very everyone's very intentional, mm-hmm. and you're, you're, you're hyper-focused on what you need to be focused on. You're not scattered mm-hmm. all, all over the place. And then another thing is every, all the successful investors are doing recon in these areas. They're, they're speaking to the neighbors. They're speaking. They're going to the bodegas. You're, going, you, you're meeting the people. <laughs> yeah. You're in the barbershops. You're doing everything that you need to do in those areas to learn the pulse of that area, whereas a lot of people, just because of the internet, they just see things like, oh, I want to go there. Right. Yeah, I want to go there. And they don't really know what the hell they're doing. They don't know the pulse of the community. They don't know anything. And they wind up losing. 
Absolutely. You know, and then they get that bad experience, and then they say, you shouldn't invest in real estate. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> the real estate is terrible, or Baltimore is terrible. And the thing about Baltimore, too, another thing that we're really big on is going to the community association meetings. So like going to where the people who are making the rule, making the decisions, who are pulling the strings for the city about um, if we're trying to do, you know, a city owned project or whatever, they're going to go to the community association to sign off. Well, we already have relationships there. Right. And mm. so being able to build those relationships here, understand what the um, goals of the community are. And so for us, we're going into these neighborhoods and spaces looking to add value there. Right. We can't do that from you know, a thousand foot view, we have to know what the people next door want, right? If we mm -hmm. want to to grow and transform Baltimore in a way that's different than Oakland or Harlem or Brooklyn or some other places where people felt DC, felt like things just happened and they had no say in it, for us to not be part of that, um, we have to be on the ground and next to the people who have been there and always been there so that we're also fulfilling their mission for their own neighborhoods and communities so that we can have development without displacement. We can be able mm -hmm. to, you development know, build without, without displacement. displacement. That's, that's a gem development like that. without displacement. That's important. Like we can we're buying vacant houses and turning them into homes. Right. We don't have to push everybody out. And and it's so crazy to me because. You know, gentrification by definition is raising the values of a community to middle class standards. So we yes. can argue all day about middle, what middle class actually means. Right. But at the end of the day, Auntie Mabel up the street likes to walk her dog. Right. She wants to be able to get fresh food on the corner and she wants to, you know, be able to do whatever as well. Yeah. Like we don't have to leave there. We shouldn't have to leave our communities um, and be there when they have their challenges and not be there when. You know, they, we can have when they, when trees they become and, beautiful. Yeah, when they're beautiful. Yeah. And so that's part of what we're trying to do is bring and add more life, but not take out and remove the life that's already there. That's dope. I love, I love that. that. That's dope. Love we can that. pop that up for that one. Man. So with your homes that you're that you're developing yeah. and you guys are building out these communities. So I imagine that you have um, programs that you're using to help these help help the community as far as renting back from you and you know how how did you go about creating those type of relationships and holding these properties and making sure that you're not displacing people that you're beautifying the community you are gentrifying the community mm -hmm. but you're not displacing them yeah that's multifold there's yeah. so many like we house kids who are aging out of foster care in our homes well we've helped our tenants um, edit resumes and keep custody of their kids, right? So there's part of that, like as a landlord, being able to do more and, and add more value to our tenants, um, but also kind of working within the community association, like what is it that you need? Like how do we help bring in additional resources? Being able to, close been doing this for a really long time. We work with some um, affordable housing nonprofits yeah. so that we can work alongside them, bring the expertise and understand how to actually do the homes. And they help make sure that the houses are permanently affordable in the same neighborhoods where we're doing market rate housing. So you have that diversity of housing stock and incomes. And so as we're, you know, we might be flipping a house, there's always that home there for I'm able if she needs it, right? Mm -hmm. And so being able to, to balance all that out. And there's an income restriction that disallows anybody who makes a certain income to, to live in that house. The houses are selling for, um, you know, 33% less than what the market is, mm -hmm. um, which is fantastic because it allows for that person to truly afford a permanently affordable house. And because we, we develop houses in a way that makes sure that the, the, uh, the house that's a market rate is um, seamless and extremely similar to the house that's a permanently affordable rate. You, can you can't tell. tell. We put islands in our permanently affordable housing. We do recess lights in our permanently affordable housing. Mm -hmm. They're really beautiful in products. Yeah. The people want to live there and they want to take care of right. it. Mm -hmm. They're not going to turn it back into a bando. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And they can be right. homeowners in these houses. They're buying these houses. So then you're 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 going from being a tenant to being a homeowner as well, which shifts kind of, that's a mindset shift. Yeah, you might mm -hmm. be the first person in your whole family that's ever owned a house. Yeah, right. And so that is is also a piece because home ownership is a cornerstone to being able to Absolutely. build that well. And no, then we also incredible. share um, information with the community association about like the homestead tax credit yeah. that mm -hmm. keeps your property taxes low and then phases it in 
so that you're not all of a sudden hit with a developer like us coming in, doing a bunch of houses, your property taxes sh shoot up immediately. Yeah. Instead, it phases in over 10, 10 years. Yeah. Um, the renter's tax credit. There's mm -hmm. all kind of different programs. Renter's tax credit. The yeah, renter's tax I've credit. Never heard that. That. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the state of Maryland has a renter's tax credit. The, the idea is that a renter, part of their rent is going towards the property taxes for the, for the owner. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how it's justified. Yeah. But the renter's tax credit is a check from the state. It's between $1,000 and $1,500. Um, and it's just it's written out to the tenant so that the tenant can afford to live right. in their home. Yeah. So if, wow. the, if the property value is increasing and then the taxes are increasing, they're assuming that the home, the landlord is also increasing your rent. Mm -hmm. And so they're able to offset the rent increase through the, the rent. Who has to credit. apply for that? The landlord or the tenant? The, the tenant. tenant. The tenant has the tenant, to apply. Which yep. is part of the challenge of, so, you know, yeah. getting yeah. people into doing that. The so challenge. Huh? Informing the community. <laughs> <Challenge. laughs> yeah. It's challenge. part of the challenge. <laughs> wink, wink. Right, right. So that making part. sure that um, the community association knows yeah. so that the people in the community know um, mm -hmm. and that information is um, disseminated to everybody who needs it. Mm -hmm. Man, that's interesting. Yeah. Maryland, the state of Maryland, and the home has to be at a certain price point. What is tax credit? Like, nope. what, are, what are some of the qualifications? No, no, no. So it's it's really just is as long as um, uh, the renter kind of shows that they are uh, income re restricted and they need the help. Mm -hmm. That's the only real criteria. Of course, yeah. there's documents and paperwork and things that they have to fill out in the process it's to go through. It's mostly paperwork. Yeah. And so that's when the challenge comes in because yeah. they don't want to do the paperwork. So it. you as the landlord will probably have to step in, mm -hmm. hold their hand a little bit, tell right. them everything's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let them know it's gonna be all right. Yeah. Let's get this paperwork done so yeah. you can you can get this benefit. Yep. How long does it take for you know? Because you know dealing with the government, always some time restraints, right? Yeah. How long does it take for this to kick in? So I've heard what a month or two. Yeah, it's not terribly long. I think the biggest thing because they have a pretty strong pot of money because it's not a whole lot of people doing it. So it's not usually a, a long waiting period. It's really just the math of how they calculate how much cash you get, but they, they do it every single year. The state of Maryland is a very wealthy state. It's one of the yeah. top. Yeah, well, Maryland's yeah. very wealthy. Yeah. 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 They got it. If not number one. They got it. They got it. Yeah, they definitely got it. Yeah, they got it. Look, um, I, I like that. I, I've never heard that before. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody who's watching this, everybody here, if you're looking to invest in Maryland and Baltimore, you need to start looking into these different programs. And you know, a couple of our investors are heavy with with, um, especially with your rentals, mm -hmm. using all these programs, because people only think Section 8, mm -hmm. Section 8, but mm -hmm. there's so many different programs yeah. in Baltimore. Like, what, same, name something else that, yeah. that, that might be an interest to the so, audience. So, um, B, I always get it mixed up, BHRP or BRHP, I get the, the letters mixed up all the mm -hmm. time, um, BRHP, um, that's a... Um, Baltimore Regional Housing Partnership is another organization in Baltimore that's similar to Section 8 in that they provide vouchers. Usually it's above market. Um, but some of the differences are that the um, the tenant actually has an assigned um, worker, like assigned um, manager, case manager, who will come to the house and like check things out. And, you know, they are making sure that your house is in, is in good standing. And they're making sure that the tenant has the resources to find the jobs and keep jobs. And they're kind of balancing based on um, the market rate and how much the tenant's making, how, you know, how much they're subsidizing. Um, but that's one of, like, personally, that's one of my favorite <laughs> oh, yeah. programs because it is seamless. It, you still get it on the first of the month, but there's more resources and support for the tenant. Um, and then you have... St. Ambrose is Saint a Ambrose. great program. Mm -hmm. It's a nonprofit in Baltimore that um, basically provides tenants and, 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 and uh, uh, funding for tenants, mm -hmm. who, for landlords and owners who want to house hack. Oh, so yeah. if you have an extra room or an extra um, uh, apartment or something, um, you can get a tenant subsidize it and uh and St. Ambrose will provide the funding. Yeah. Hold on. So they room. they're promoting house hacking? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Indirectly, yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. love this. Yeah. yeah. And then you don't even have to have a separate unit, right? So you can have be in a single family home and sometimes people feel like they can't house hack that, right? You need multiple units. Well with St. Ambrose, you can rent a room through St. Ambrose to an individual person and they have a voucher. To help support that. Oh, that's amazing. That's a gem right there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. House hacking through programs. House hacking through programs. Gotta love it's real. Gotta love Maryland. Right. <laughs> right. You gotta love Maryland. I love this. So, so let's talk about you you guys own blocks. About mm -hmm. how many, how many properties do you own right now? And um, are you cash flowing? And of course, you're buying a hold. So I can imagine you're not, you guys aren't in this to flip. You're here to 
create community and hold onto these properties? Yeah, so we have a mixture. So one of the things that is we've found, especially as we tapped into what the communities want and the city wants, is that they want to build home ownership. They have plenty of renters, right? And so they want to build home ownership to help create that wealth, make sure people have ownership in what's happening in their neighborhoods. You tend to see when people own that they place a little bit more value to what's going on. Um, so we've been kind of balancing between our rental portfolio, which we had, you know, well over 20 units by the time we were 30. Um, but the but some of the block projects has been how do we transform these vacant houses into homes and create homeowners in the process? Um, and so. Um, right now, I mean, we have what I mean, so six or seven active renovation projects. Nice. Like yep. right this moment, mm -hmm. um, we and these have, are for sale flips. Yeah, these are mm. for yeah. sale. Yep. Um, we have three that are about to close in the next like yeah four weeks. Um, We've been in control of because it's not necessarily how much you own, right? It's what you're in control of, mm -hmm. um, and we all know that through different entities and and, and things like that, but hundreds of different properties yeah. um, that we've been in control of o over the years. So just to give a little timeline, we we started with the rentals. We built our rental portfolio so that back in 2015, 16, we both left our permanent jobs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, we had enough money from our rental incomes to sustain yeah. our life. Uh, and then we decided to flip. We could have definitely sat on those rentals, paid them off, kept, you know, snowballing by another rental every mm -hmm. year and been completely fine. Um, but we wanted to flip. So yeah. um, we started doing that and then we scaled that business up yep. um, so that we have multiple flips that are uh, in the different processes and different phases currently yeah. um, to the point where uh, we looked at our construction company, our, our A team, mm -hmm. right, our primary GC. Um, he had an event where one of his partners exited. He was looking for a partner, so we acquired it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we recently acquired a construction company, which That's is great, all. and mm -hmm. increased our, our standing and increased our um, uh, bandwidth and, and capacity and yeah. controlled our cost, vertically mm -hmm. integrated. Um, Prices uh, got too high. We had to make sure we controlled. Yeah, control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Prices up, up. Yeah, up, up. All of them. And yeah. it was kind of stuck. For exactly. a second. <laughs> yeah. You know how we do it here. <laughs> so let's speak about bandwidth, right? Yeah. You guys got a new project that you're working on, mm -hmm. right? So the floor is yours with this one because oh, yeah. this is something special. It's on the screen. I see something yeah, it's special. Yeah, it's on the screen yeah, right now. So, this so let's talk fun. about your, your new baby. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is our new baby. This one's fun. So um, uh, the RFP came out. So for those who don't know, an RFP is a request for pr proposals. So a city or a private person has some land and they say, I don't know what to, to do with it. Give me a proposal, m multiple people, um, whoever has the best, they, they, they win. Um, so we submitted, a um, bunch of people did, and we, we won. Mm -hmm. Right. Nice. So we're going to be building about 50 houses, brand new town houses right by Johns Hopkins Hospital. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So it's on the screen right now. So tell us about what we're looking at on the screen right now, because this yeah. is this look, this rendering looks beautiful. Thank <laughs> you. Appreciate it. Yeah. So our, our architect is great. Um, <laughs> this is in an area called Eager Park. It's a brand new area um, in Baltimore City, like I said, right by Johns Hopkins Hospital. Mm -hmm. um, uh, unfortunately, back in early two, 2000s, a lot of people were displaced mm -hmm. out, of, out of this area. And eminent domain allowed the city to capture a lot of houses. Mm -hmm. They were bandos, they were, they were vacants, they were boarded. Um, now people got paid to leave, right? And, and they happily received their check. And, What's and eminent domain out. for the people mm -hmm. who don't know what that is? Eminent domain is basically when um, a property is uh, so um, disinvested in, in that um, the city has to take over. Right. Okay. Or well, the um, city decided they had something better to do with that space. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So between those two. Yeah. So they basically yeah. come and say, look, we're going to you. commandeer your shit and yeah. get the hell up out of here. Either time time fix it or we're taking it. Yeah. yeah. Or we're taking it or we're taking it. Yeah. Because that's, that's what they yeah. 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 They're taking it. Because yeah. they're yeah. doing that in parts of yeah. um, parts of Atlanta. Yeah. When they start expanding highways, they will just literally. They're going to take your home. Yep. And that happens often. So now. What happened from there? Yeah. yeah so from there, um, this 88 acre area was parceled off and then sold to mm -hmm. different folks. This was beginning in call it 2005 until now. Um, so now there's a new hotel there. Uh, there's a bunch of new food retail mm -hmm. in the area. There's Starbucks. a beautiful. Starbucks. There's a uh, Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, we That's all love when we see the Starbucks in the Target. We're, we're like, no. yeah, we're up now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's a brand new beautiful school, mm -hmm. state of the art. It was the first school built in uh, in this area in the last 25 years or so. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there's a brand new park with outdoor workout equipment, with um, a playground and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful area. It does have a difficult history. So part of the RFP was, okay, we need people who can um, bring back displaced folks, mm -hmm. folks who left and want to come back. We have to provide housing for them. So affordable housing was part of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, economic inclusion was part of it. So providing opportunities to businesses that are minority owned, women owned, uh, local businesses and a whole bunch of different things. But we put the team together. Um, shout out to the other uh, small minority owned developer, Mason Dixon and Properties. Um, and, uh, and we have a, a very strong team and we won. Mm -hmm. But the best part about this mm -hmm. and um, uh, the best part about this for me, I should say, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is that um, my, my former employer, who I left a while oh, ago, um, competed for this project. And they lost. Uh, <laughs> and they lost. That's a gem. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. They competed and messy. took it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes you work so hard, it's okay just to be a little petty. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's okay. Yeah, it's we okay. like petty over here at the ranch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you guys got all this going on. I think we want to start with, okay, you started with one property. You started going into yeah. buying blocks. You know, what were some, like, what are some small, simple steps? Like, this is, this is huge. Like, mm -hmm. you, you've gotten here. Let's talk about to, to, let's talk to someone that is looking to just develop a block. Mm -hmm. Tell them how you went about it, like financing, just some something, some quick things, and where they need to go to find this government funding and yeah. get all these resources. So that way, that most of us think we just got to do all of these things out of pocket. And talking to you all, you're like, oh no, I, I'm using the resources that that are that are available to me, so mm -hmm. I can you know, leverage those to create, to create my um, portfolio. So the first thing, because everyone wants to buy the block, right? That's mm -hmm. a pretty dope hashtag. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Not everybody really knows and understands the work that becomes, mm. that goes behind being able to say, like, I did that, right? And so for me, it's really important to set that stage because it, I'm very glad that we started with, you know, kind of building up as we got there. Because buying a block, that means that there is a block of properties that have been disinvested or sitting vacant. For you to buy and renovate and develop this block, especially for not only rental housing, but also in particular, um, being able to flip the property, you're not just selling the house, you're selling the entire neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? Then when you think about trying to finance the properties and doing things like that, your appraisals, evaluations and stuff, you creating the market, you're creating your own comps. Yeah. Like that's work. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about that as developers, we talk about being the first loser because that's mm -hmm. the truth of the matter. When you're starting on that block, you're starting from behind because you're creating the wave that you're gonna get to at the end. And so I'm big on, I'm so big on setting that foundation. Like you're not gonna get the BS from me. You have to understand that they're going into that project. You have to know that um, that that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, okay, so get off of that. So how do you find it? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I mean? Okay, I'm gonna get off of that. No, so I, I, no I, would, but, I like that you stayed there yeah. because now let's talk about it. So let's say you bought your first block, yeah. you got the first property. How did you, how were you able to develop this property, set the comps to get the next one and the next one and the next one? Yeah. Like what did you do to ensure that you can continue to bring these values up because that is what buying the block is. is about. That's what it's all about. So the first one, we had to set the stage to be able to really tell our story. Like you have to control mm -hmm. that narrative and be very intentional about who your listing agent is. Do they do they buy into your entire vision? Um, and then really being able to market the entire neighborhood. We started to work with the community associations and other developers in the area about what they were doing because now your success is my success. So how do I help you get your project that you said you were going to start six months ago off the ground, right? Because right? yeah. we all need to be able to do this together. So it's a lot of networking. You get from, um, you get out of, you know, really analyzing this individual deal to really working through like, how do I underwrite this entire neighborhood? Like that's, it's a mm. different conversation. Um, and then you bring in, you know, um, uh, city councilmen and all this political stuff comes in as well. You, you, it's, it's different than just, I'm gonna do the 65 or 70% rule at this point. It doesn't yeah. work that way. <laughs> but for your first project, you have to really budget that that's not gonna sell as quickly as your other ones. If you're going to, 
Um, if you're trying to flip or even if you're doing rentals, chances are you're funding with probably short term capital money that you're kind of coming in. You got a construction loan or something. You have to pay those off faster mm -hmm. um, typically. And so you have to build into your budget the fact that you're probably going to need to sit on this one a little bit longer than the others. Um, and. Um, you have to have, you're going to, you need to have that plan. You got to have money. This isn't like the no money. <laughs> this definitely, this ain't the no credit. Like this ain't, you're not there yet. If that's the conversation you're trying to have. Um, but, but yeah, so you want to get, you want to have everything set up where if you're going to work with short term capital, you have more patient capital or money that can mm -hmm. 15, 30 year refinance money that you have ready to go. If you're trying to keep keep the property as a as a rental mm. and whoever you're working with um we always talk about you want to build your well before you're thirsty so you're building those relationships with those lenders early on so that they even they're not paying as much attention to the numbers of the properties because they might be a little bit janky when you're starting right yeah but yeah. they know and understand you right yeah. they're investing in you and your vision and what yep. you're able to do more so than the the numbers on it's the first awesome. few deals because yeah. that can be that can be hard. So you have to have like a bigger game and you know a larger vision to really be able to do it, especially in spaces like Baltimore. So mm -hmm. you know, Baltimore is one of those cities that I personally feel gets redlined a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Right? It's the oh, birthplace of redlining. Yeah, it's definitely the birthplace Literally, of redlining. Yeah. Right. So now how are you guys getting the funding and the financing? for a project of this scale mm -hmm. when it's the birthplace mm -hmm. of redlining. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those, those relationships. Yeah, yeah, the, <laughs> the relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we're fortunate in this project where a lot of the other developments have, have already happened. Right? Oh, the the yep. comps are mm -hmm. stronger yep. at this point. Yeah. Um, like Kiara said, there's a Starbucks. We got the Walgreens. There's a hotel there. Um, there's a lot of different amenities in the area. So the market is there mm -hmm. at this point. But when you're first starting out buying a block. I mean, it's it's tough. Yeah. And what what we learned that um, that had we gone back in time for our first block and and done it again over, um, you got to get the city involved as yeah. quickly as mm -hmm. possible. Mm. Uh, Department of Housing, mm -hmm. um, uh, the Housing Authority, mm -hmm. whomever has cash, mm -hmm. because it's it's a mindset shift. Every city wants to increase the population. Mm -hmm. um, they want to provide housing. They want to provide jobs. Right. So um, when you think about it, OK, if the city wants to provide housing, they, they want to incentivize that and they will pay dollars through grants mm -hmm. in order to help people build houses in areas that otherwise are disinvested. Mm -hmm. um, so when you have the idea and the plan and the numbers don't quite work, you reach out to the city. Look, this is the pro forma, the financial model, the capital stack. This is the gap. Yeah. This is what I need you, Mr. or Mrs. Mayor. To participate in. Yeah. So let me let's talk about capital stack, mm -hmm. right? right. <laughs> we on the same page. Just <laughs> the same thing. Capital okay. stack. <laughs> Break down what is a capital stack yeah. and how do you go about on yeah. a capital stack? Yeah. Stack. Yep. So the capital stack is essentially a stack of money, mm -hmm. right? It's it's how the project is funded. Mm -hmm. um, so you got your debt at you know somewhere between sixty to eighty percent loan to value. Typically, mm -hmm. it's sixty five. You got your equity. Um, the money that you're putting in or your investors are putting in. Um, and then you have like tax credits. You can have grants. You can have um, uh, a, a few other other items. But that's the capital stack. It's mm -hmm. the stack of money that allows you to do a development deal, whether it's one house mm -hmm. or it's 50 houses. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. I, 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 I like that. It. That was a good breakdown. Mm -hmm. That was a gem mm -hmm. for those because right. I know a lot of people when they handcap, they don't know what the hell right. that yeah. means. So, you know, you got to break that down. for yeah. Them. Yeah. Absolutely. So when you guys first started off, like, you know, I always like to bring it back down to step one mm -hmm. because everybody always looks at, you know, they don't look at someone's chapter 20 when you're on chapter one, right? Absolutely. So let's just say they want to buy one property or develop one property. They could still go to um, go and find these programs that will help them develop one property because what the key word here and what I'm starting to find is you're not talking about what you're doing for yourself. So if you're like, I'm going to develop this property because I want it to be affordable housing for this area, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to help this community. And if I can do this property and set the comp, then I can buy this property and that one. So how do you kind of create that package? And um, like you said, just Google, go to different places, but you're finding the money. What I see the key sense is you're using other people's money, mm -hmm. but you're not using lenders' money. You are going for the government grants and programs and you're mm -hmm. basically changing communities. Yeah. yeah. And there's something really specific that you said. I want to touch on it really yeah. quickly. And the next one and the next one and then yes. do more. Right. 
you have to be able to articulate the vision. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, um, yes, $40,000 into a house from, from a grant is great. Um, everybody has to start with one house, but they also have to know what that vision is, that, that bigger vision. They want mm -hmm. to put, put $400,000 into 10 houses. Right. Right? They don't want to just do one, one house and then you leave and back out and, and, and that's it. Yeah. Um, so being able to say, yes, we're doing one now because we have to get started, but this one's vacant, this one's vacant. I've contacted the owner here under contract. We have everything ready to, 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 to rock and roll. Let's do this first one, yeah. year year one, and then let's scale up very quickly, very aggressively so that you guys can see what we can do. That's important for people who are looking to uh, yeah. uh, leverage those funds. Yeah, and we're close, especially with in Baltimore specifically, having kind of that vision and a bigger package is really how you get most of that money, right? Mm -hmm. In Baltimore, it's so easy to get money to buy a property that you're going to live in. They give mm -hmm. in, they just like yeah. throwing money at that, which is amazing. But as an investor, if you don't have like a package, it's harder to get the grant funds until you're in like a bigger space, until you're doing a block right. or things like that. Um, but in the meantime, it's about being creative with your funding sources. So um, having the audacity to ask an auctioneer to sell or finance. Right. The Talking about having the yeah. audacity yeah. to ask. You right? asked me to sell it. I'm an auction I'm, house, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Having the audacity to ask and being okay with hearing no, because mm. a no now isn't a no forever, especially in this in this market That's and in gem. this, this yeah. real estate. Yeah. 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 Real Close estate. mouth don't get fat. Never. Period. At all. Um, and so um, and so be, having that audacity to ask, being creative, understanding, like checking your own mi mindset around money, like they literally print that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in this past year, they had that on overdrive, right? <laughs> yeah. it was, it was, yeah. Everybody rich. Everybody, everybody got to get money. So, yeah. so understanding kind of shifting that mindset because the money is out there. It's just really about you putting yourself in a position to, to get a hold of that because you probably know somebody that has a bunch of money just sitting in a bank account somewhere, earning nothing on it, well, maybe you can put that money to work a little bit better and be able to leverage that to, to do your own portfolio. So we've always been really creative with how we've structured our mm -hmm. rental property to be able to roll those funds or whatever we want to do into other projects that we were doing if we were using hard money or nonprofits or whatever else to do more. Everything's a tool. Yeah, everything. everything. Yeah. Everything. You, well, how about this? You said there were, there has to be a package, right? Yeah. You know, from a realtor standpoint, I pretty much know what should be in the package, but yeah. I want you to share with someone that, listen... I want to buy this house and I know it's in an area that's a little challenging. Mm -hmm. What are three things I need to put in my package before I start Googling the gov what, what government mm -hmm. funding Fun and yeah. funding from my community? What are three main things I need to know so I can also create my own package so mm -hmm. I can start leveraging these funds? Mm -hmm. The first one is the finances. Period, yes. Right. You, you got to have your numbers. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I mean, that's just, that's that's where you where you can ask for the gap. Yeah. Um, whether that's 10000 or 100000 mm -hmm. that's where you can um, uh, know what your construction costs are or your closing costs, your acquisition, all the different uh, expenses that go through your, your carry costs, which a lot of people miss. Yeah. yeah. Um, you you got to have those fi financials yeah. in the, that package. Yeah, the numbers are important. And then you got to be able to show your capacity to actually do the job. Mm -hmm. So what's your experience? Who's on your team? What's your construction company doing? What have they done? What have you done? So having showing Where's the that, receipts? Where the, give me the receipts, bro. Mm -hmm. Let me know that if I'm giving you this money, that you know what to do with it, right? Um, and so that's going to be really big as as number two. And then the third is is the vision. You got to be able to tell the story. You have to be able to connect with the person making the decisions and, and controlling the purse strings that they're investing in something that's larger so that they have a story to tell to whoever they're, they're accountable yeah. to. Right? Yeah. You got to give them the language to sell it. Man. Lots of gems in this episode from Bando to Blocks, man. A lot of information. Um, so, rants and gems. We like to always end mm -hmm. with uh, a rant. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> I, I do that well. And, <laughs> and a gem. So, give us a rant. What's pissing you off right now? We want to know. All right, so I'm going to take it back because y'all mentioned The Wire. And so I said, <laughs> I can't help it. I, I'm mad. I'm sorry. I'm coming down. Let me tell you. Let me, let me, look, let because me break it down. Because on the outside, that's what I, we're no, seeing. Me and Stringer Bell yeah. was friends, though. In my head, yeah. people yeah. love that show. They love them some Omar. But you know what? That put such a, um, like, The Wire in Baltimore became synonymous, yeah. right? And it was a great show, but it's terrible branding for the city. <laughs> like, it's terrible yeah. branding. And the truth of the matter is, um, you know, Baltimore has bandos 
and they have multi-million dollar houses and they don't, ain't but two, three miles apart, yeah. right? And so when mm. we talk about Baltimore, we have to be very careful about um, labeling it with one one broad brush, mm. understanding that there is a lot. And even the things that you think about with Baltimore with crime or whatever else, a lot of times, if you really narrow that down to where a lot of that stuff's happening, you might pick four, five, six corners. Mm. And that's it, right? And so we have, like, I'm very, like, sensitive on that specifically because it, it just, it paints one broad brush. There's so much going on in Baltimore. We, well, we live, I'm gonna say this, but we are, you know, in a space where we got four floors that all look at water. Mm. And we're in a be- we got an elevator inside talk the house. Talk your shit, girl. Okay? No, talk your shit. Yeah. What's the name of that place you guys got? Um, it's the outdoor place you can go eat the food and um, come on. It's where all the seafood. All is? the seafood at not the wharf though, not the wharf. The, at the harbor. At the, the harbor. harbor. Yeah. The harbor. Yeah. The harbor. Oh, See, since yeah. you're from there, yeah, it's not the a big harbor. deal to yeah. you. But the let harbor. me tell you, for us out of town, this is a big deal. Yeah. yeah. And you can go out there, you can eat, and yeah. it's, it's so Sounds beautiful sweet. there, and it's yeah. so gorgeous. So I, I can understand your yeah. frustration. Yeah. There's a lot of beautiful places. We got the best food. Yeah. We have amazing <laughs> culture. I ain't gonna even hold you up on the food. Yeah. The food. The seafood is next level. It's next level. The food, and we have so many new restaurants. Like there's a lot of development. There's a lot of money hitting the street in Baltimore mm-hmm. right now. There's Good. so much happening. And so, like, you know, we got to see that. We got to see opportunity in our neighborhoods. So the rent is stop calling Bima on the wire. Stop we are not, not the wire. Stop. Stop. Can I get a rent? I get one get too. Your rent. Get, a rent. get your rent. Yo, when people come in, they buy a house and they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. They buy a bando. They want these dollar houses. They heard about some ancient program from mm-hmm. once upon a time. You got yeah. it. Okay, no, you, you said that like a like it was like a quick little clip. But you have to kind of expound about that just a little bit. Just yeah. a little bit yeah. about these dollar houses how it works, if they're still available, and I understand your rent. But you got to say, this is my rent, but this is the solution. Yes. All right, Give me the rent in the gym on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the rent in the gym. All right, so the Dollar House program back in the 80s, 1980s, um, they had a program, you can buy a dollar house, um, uh, and then you fix it up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the ca- caveats to that, they, uh, the, the city had a bunch of money, they could lend it out, mm-hmm. right? So you got low interest loans to help fix it out. These dollar houses were in very specific areas. They weren't the whole city. Mm -hmm. Um, The program's no longer here. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just not. And and in our opinion, it's probably not going to come back, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, whether that's good or bad. So, like, when people come into Baltimore, they find uh, uh, affordable, vacant houses that they want to buy and they want to fix up and they want to rent and sell. um, But then they get stuck. Mm -hmm. That's my rent, Mm -hmm. right? So my, my gym on that is, like, find some mentors run the numbers, know the comps, drive the area, understand the area. Can you be successful in Baltimore? Absolutely. Absolutely, right? Mm-hmm. We have All been, we, we have mentors. And not mentees. just us. Yeah, we have tons of people who we know who are very um, successful in scaling and growing, mm-hmm. um, specifically in the area. But like, take the time to make sure that you, uh, you do it the right way. Right. That's the gym. That's the yeah. gym. Do your due diligence. <laughs> right. Do yeah. your research. All 5,000 our houses ain't good deals. Yeah. <laughs> Everything yeah. that glitters ain't gold. Yeah. Huh? Right. That's what they say, right? That's what they say. That's nah, what they tell You got a gym for us? Because you gave us some rent. I have, I'm great at rants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the gym, I think, I, I mean, I think the gym really is like, we, we really have, we're in a time where we have the opportunity and the ability to take control of what's happening in our neighborhoods. Mm. And we just, it's time to do it. Time to do I it. I love time that. Gentrify our own hoods. All right. Do we have any questions? Anyone have any questions for us? They quiet. Okay, they quiet. <laughs> they quiet. So look, this was a, a, a great episode. Um, thank you guys for thank coming all the way from B More, yeah. all the way down here to Wakanda. <laughs> right. <laughs> and joining us. And um, you know, showing us our project because this is something that you guys haven't told anyone yeah. in the um, internet world. Yeah, so thank you for dropping the exclusive here on the Rants and Gem Show. We definitely appreciate you guys. Um, tell the people how to find you, how to hit you guys up. If they want to join one of your programs, let them know. Yeah, you can find us uh, at Charm City Buyers everywhere. So on Instagram and Twitter um, and YouTube. And you can check us out at CharmCityBuyers.com. We have a really dope, completely free class all about what's happening in Baltimore and why people all over the country need to be investing in Baltimore right alongside us. So you can find that at charmcitybuyers.com. I love that. I love thank it. You. I love it. So look, man, thank you guys again. Matt Garland here and MLS number 58700, better known as MG the Mortgage Guy. And I am Kiana Watson, broker extraordinaire, license number 317576. 
Thank you guys for tuning in to the Rants and Gems show. Peace. Thank you.